Welcome to season two of Classical Education, a podcast for those who believe in rediscovering the art of asking questions, engaging in conversation, and attending to the ideas at the heart of well-ordered teaching and learning. Adrian Fries and Trey Bailey invite you to join them on a journey in pursuit of the true, the good, and the beautiful as we participate in the great conversation and listen to the many voices coming from the world of classical education. Before we start our show, I wanted to remind our listeners that we are a listener-supported podcast. If you're a fan of our podcast, please join us for a very special Patreon-sponsored event. We're hosting a free online listening party with our favorite music professor, Dr. Carol Reynolds, and a rising star cellist, Justin Hall. This musical event will be streamed live on October 22nd at 3 o'clock Central and 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock Eastern and 2 o'clock Central. Enjoy beautiful live music and spirited conversation from a rising young musician and a world-class music professor and guide. Hear a live defense of good music and gain new skills for listening to classical music. And interact with the hosts, myself and Trey, and other supporters of the Classical Education Podcast. If you want a Zoom link to this free event, please email me at beautifulteaching at gmail.com. That's beautifulteaching at gmail.com. Or join our Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash classical education. That's patreon.com forward slash classical education. And uh, through our Patreon page, that is how you can financially support our podcast. But this event is a free live event. and You do not have to be a Patreon member to enjoy this event. Simply email me again at beautifulteaching at gmail.com. All right. Trey and I are here with a wonderful guest. We're very humbled and excited to have Dr. Matthew Post from the University of Dallas. And uh, Matt and I have worked together for a few years. And I was thinking back to when I first met him, which I don't know if Matt remembers as well as I do, but it was, I believe, at a um, Beauty in the Arts conference that Dr. Uh, Carol Reynolds, Professor Carol in Music, was hosting at a little church and uh, he came to speak about beauty, and uh, it really, really impacted me deeply. I remember um, asking him for his email because <laughs> I wanted to email him some questions. And then years later, when 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 our paths crossed again, um, and he brought me in to work with him at UD on some projects, um, I, re I, sh I found my notebook with all the notes I had taken about beauty that he had shared. And I, th I think Dr. Post, well, I'll probably call him Matt, through the podcast oh, since yes, I've worked please. with you. Is that okay? Yes, yes. I think he has such an incredible depth of understanding of the transcendentals, uh, truth, goodness, and beauty. That uh, And there's a lot of topics that he could cover with us today, but I, I think that we're going to try to stick with the topic of beauty. I think it's a really important topic. And, and, and of the transcendentals, beauty seems to be the one that gets dropped the fastest um, and seems to be lacking in many schools. <clears throat> So I wanted to start off with this quote from um, a book called The Ethics of Beauty by Timothy Patitsis. He says, whenever we are called to teach, our proclamation of goodness should be so wrapped in beauty as to console. This should apply to our daily actions as well, and it is an art. So I was thinking um, with regard to that quote being so important to the art of teaching, I would like to have Matt share us a story about how the art of teaching can draw forth the goodness and truth of beauty. And I know he has many stories. Um, so any story you want to share on that, Matt, would be great. Oh, sure. Thanks. Thanks for asking about this. And that's a that's an inspiring quotation. Um, before answering your question, though, let me just say that... Uh, you know, uh, I do remember us meeting and your own devotion um, to great education and your insights into things are so profound that uh, it's a real blessing to know you. So thank you. And, and it's a pleasure to be here. Um, so about the art of teaching, then I guess we'll discuss more how the ancients understood beauty. Um, in a minute. But one thing that I would say right off the bat is it does, of course, concern order. And 
And I think sometimes as a teacher, uh, it would be really nice if things were ordered, more ordered. And we will often talk in classical education about Socratic seminar. And maybe if you've taught this, you'll have a moment where the seminar is going and you start to see it's derailing. And it's not going in the direction that you would like. And what do you do in that moment? You know, do you kind of come in and shut down the conversation? Um, sometimes a teacher might try a few subtle things and they don't work. And then you realize, well, we have to be heavy handed here if I'm going to have order. But the, the trick of it is, is that you want to have that order so there's beauty. But being heavy handed isn't necessarily beautiful. Right. So you, you come upon what might appear to be a paradox um, or a problem that you want to have beauty, but somehow in the work of trying to make things more beautiful or helping the kids appreciate beauty, it just doesn't seem to go the way you'd like. But you asked me about an occasion when it went well, and, and this is a preface to describing that. So once there was a class and we had a guest lecturer and he was talking about Dante. And it rarely in my life have I ever seen anything like this. It was a seminar. The students were highly engaged and you had multiple lines of discussion going at the same time. And, and for myself, normally once this starts to happen, I kind of need to pick up the reins a little and have a focus. He didn't do that. He was actually able to manage the multiple lines of conversation that were going on um, without coming in in a heavy handed way. And then just throwing out these very brief, very, very smart questions that would start to connect them. Mm. Um, and the students were hearing it and they were picking it up. And if you've ever read Dante, by the way, it's really, I mean, it's beautiful, but it's very hard to understand why he puts certain people in hell, why their punishments are what they are. So the students start struggling with these very difficult, very profound esoteric questions and he's leading them and almost really like, um, I say almost, but in a way not like a conductor. In a way, it's not like a conductor because there you're practicing and training um, weeks, months right. for that moment, whereas he just came in cold and he's doing this, right? But like a conductor in the sense that, you know, his hands would go up and he'd gesture towards someone, gesture towards someone else and just kind of bringing everything together. And, and then he brought the threads together, which by the way, were driven by the students. He opened up with the, the typical question, what what strikes you as wondrous about this or what, what puzzled you about this? And, and then in the end, he had tied the threads together and they actually even came to a degree of a conclusion about the part of Dante that they were reading. And it was amazing, right? Essentially what you had was something that started out very chaotically, became more and more ordered, but in a way which it was guiding. The student's freedom was not being hindered in any way they felt like they, and in many ways, they were driving it. And then they even came up with an answer at the end, which is not necessarily a final answer. Actually, this was the beauty of it. When they came to the answer at the end, he could have just sat back and everyone would have been in awe. And then he was like, but you know, this provokes some other questions. And then he threw out some other questions that kind of undercut a little bit and unsettled the conclusion they came to. And he said, you know, these are some things for us to think about next time. So he didn't even allow things to arrive at a at a kind of dry conclusion. He just, he, he, he stirred it back up and then he sent them out of the room filled with these new questions and talking to each other, right? So what I think about that as encapsulating the art of teaching and integrating beauty into it is precisely hitting that tricky place that you have to hit where you respect freedom um, and yet you, and you trust your students, right? For that if you are able to have the right questions, you can guide them and beauty will emerge, but you're not in charge of it, actually. In some ways you're trusting to human nature, right? You're trusting that there is a nature and that there's an order to the work that they're talking about and that you don't have to be heavy handed and that this beauty will emerge and that you are at most, you know, like a farmer to the field, right? You're not the author of the sun or the rain or the nutrients of the earth or the capacity of the plant to grow but you just gently arrange things so that that plant flourishes. And I think that he captured that beautifully. But another reason I tell this story is because this was a guest lecture. Mm -hmm. And I remember afterwards I said to him, I said, that was one of the most amazing classes I ever, I've ever seen. 
And he said, yeah, he's like, for me too. He's like, uh, mm. whoever the regular teacher is must be really amazing, you know? Because <laughs> <laughs> so, he said, you know, it's, it's, you know, really due to her and, you know, the weeks and months that she spent with them also getting them into, you know, helping to form them and shape them so that when he came in, he was able to do this. And I appreciated that remark because it, it makes you reflect on beauty on a, on a deeper level, which is that mm. it's not just about some masterful teacher coming into a room and conducting the symphony. It's also about the community um, mm. and the work of the teacher that had these students before him and, you know, their parents and the spirit mm -hmm. of the school and all the other things that contribute to this moment, which again is not the work of any single person, but something that we do together. And, and in working together, of course, that is another form of order and beauty. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a wonderful story, Matt. And as you were telling it, I, I picked up on two things that I think we can, we can uh, use to further our conversation. Uh, one is, and you mentioned the sun, right? One is a way of thinking about beauty as a ray of light, okay? So a, a path or, or you know, um, if, if we're thinking in terms of the transcendentals and maybe for the benefit of all of our listeners, Matt, maybe you can just define that term for us. But if, uh, if, if God, let's say, is the source of beauty um, or is beauty itself, um, then we can think of the rays of light um, as, as sort of how beauty works and, and sort of has its effect on us, right? It sort of, it, it draws us to God, right? And through, through looking through that beam or uh, by that beam, we can, we, can, we can see beauty itself. And so beauty is a way. And so the way that the, that the professor in your story taught the class was beautiful in and of itself which um, was able to guide uh, his students to, um, to the, the beautiful idea that he was trying to get them to, to consider and experience. And then the second thing is um, this idea of formation. So the students had been formed in such a way that they could respond to that beauty in a way that allowed for the conversation to take place. You know, that idea of a conversation being being, um, you know, at least two people turning towards the same idea. Mm -hmm. And the fact that the students had been shaped in, in, in a certain way allowed them to respond to the path as it was put down in front of them. Yeah, actually, and I'm glad you brought that up because there is one part of the quotation I didn't really speak to, which was the good, right? I spoke about the art of teaching and beauty, but not the good. And, um, if you'll bear with me, I actually might uh, discuss the transcendentals in the context of um, some things I've read in Plato. And one of the things that the Platonic Socrates will talk about is how in our day-to-day -day experience, you do see things that have a degree of order. You also see things that are kind of chaotic um, and they tend to be mixed together. But you also see things that seem to have a principle of motion in themselves and that's that's what he means by soul uh, which is a little different from the way we would use it right we think of human beings as having souls we might talk about whether animals have souls we don't think plants have souls but for the platonic socrates that's not the definition of soul right um plants grow of themselves therefore they have souls planets move of themselves, therefore they have souls, um, which doesn't mean, you know, they reflect on things the way we do. Um, but what's interesting about this, the reason why you want to talk about soul is because soul is a place where something which might be disordered becomes more ordered, right? Mm -hmm. So um, the plant takes these, you know, to go back to this, these nutrients of the earth, which are just kind of lying there. And there's a degree of order to them, but they're just kind of lying there. And then it organizes them into these processes of life. Um, now, what is a transcendental in looking at something like that? Well, this is what he'd say is, you know, chaotic things are in motion, ensouled things are in motion, but it's more orderly. And the question is, where does order come from? And one of the answers that Socrates explores is that for there to be order in an otherwise chaotic world, there has to be something unchanging. That is the stable ground 
from which order becomes possible. Because if you didn't have that, chaos just produces more chaos, right? So why would you call that stable ground transcendent or a transcendental? Because we human beings are still changeable. We're not unchanging. Um, and if there is something, if you want to call it being or the good, the beautiful, but whatever this is, this does transcend us because it is unchanging, but we are changing. And, and that means there's some level on which we can't understand it ever. And then you'd be like, well, if you can't understand it ever, then how do you know it's there? And his point is, well, you do know it's there because it is responsible for order. So the degree to which you are able to make sense out of things, the very activity of making sense out of something is you participating in, communing with, coming close to, or somehow engaging with what is unchanging, right? And the argument would be that, for example, a form of beauty that you see in human psychology is virtue, just as a form of beauty in human bodies is fitness, right? So in human psychology, it's virtue and virtuous living, being moderate, uh, being able to make a promise and keep it, um, being able to stand your ground in the face of frightening things, um, and then harder things, thinking through putting aside your own selfish interests in order to serve others when you know that that's the right thing to do, right? So these are things that make you a stable, reliable person, and it makes you capable of setting goals and following through on them, just as the strong body is able to accomplish things. And this stability that emerges in human psychology, uh, someone like Socrates would say, well, that's, that's your participation in the beautiful or the noble, right? It's, it's, those both mean the same. It's one word in Greek for that, which is uh, uh, in the neuter, ta kalon is how you describe it. But to get to the point of, so that's in some way trying to explain what a transcendental is. But for the Platonic Socrates, you know, he's not Christian. Um, and the way that he talks about the transcendentals is as something that in some way or another we can know, we can access through participation. But of course, God is on some level radically transcendent to us, not completely. The incarnation is uh, a sign that God can communicate with us and reach down to us as are other things that we see in scripture. Um, you know, God speaks to Adam and Eve in the garden. But there's still a level on which God is radically transcendent. And the, and the way someone like the Platonic Socrates understands the transcendentals, it's not that radically transcendent. So there are things that you can say about the transcendentals um, that describe them to some way or another accurately. Um, but something that I think is important to note here is that for the Platonic Socrates, the good and the beautiful are not the same thing. They describe different things. And the good in several platonic texts not in all of them right uh platonic you know platonic texts are such variety and they they explore different possibilities but one of the ways that the good is is discussed in say for example the republic or the timaeus or the symposium um, all of which are very major texts in the platonic corpus um, is that the good is responsible for reproduction Right? And that is distinguished from being responsible for order. Now, it might be the case that what is reproduced is order, you know. Um, but, but can you have order without reproduction? And I think the answer is yes. And this is one of the reasons why beauty is tricky. You know, um, can you force order onto people? Yes, plainly one can do this. Um, can you be tyrannical and pursue order? Yeah. But can you do that and be good? And I and uh, and the order that ensues, can it have a degree of beauty to it? And I think the Platonic Socrates would say, yes. Yes, it can have a degree of beauty. And if you think beauty and the good are the same thing, this can lead you astray. You can think that tyrannically imposing beauty is the same as being good, and it isn't. The reproductive character of the good means that and that's something that emerges. Teaching is really, in this sense, I think, for the Platonic Socrates, almost like the most profound activity of the good. Because when you're teaching, if you help to cultivate virtue in someone else, what's happening there in a Platonic account is you are helping the student to encounter the beautiful, which then allows the reproduction of some kind of beauty in their soul, which is virtue. 
but that power by which that occurs is the good. And when you have the beautiful and the good together, the kind of virtue which is reproduced in the soul is capable of continuing to reproduce beauty. Maybe, whether that means they can reproduce beauty once they're out of your school, mm -hmm. right? They have a degree of independence and they can do things on their own, or they go on and become teachers themselves or parents or great friends who are able to help inspire other people to beauty. That's what happens when the good and the beautiful both are honored. Mm -hmm. But when just the beautiful is honored, right, and you impose beauty in a tyrannical or coercive way, what happens is the second that that teacher is gone, chaos results, right? <laughs> That's the kind of situation when you have the guest lecturer come in or the substitute teacher and the kids misbehave, right? Um, because for them, it's all about the coercion and the fear. And when that coercion and fear is gone, then the beauty is gone, right? And... This is something also I know, Adrian, you're reading The Republic. This is something that's highlighted in The Republic is that, again, through coercion and fear, if you impose order, all you actually do, you don't actually remove the disorder in the uh, child's soul. You just constrain it. Um, and the way it's described there is it's like tending to the symptoms of a disease, but never curing the disease, right? And you leave the patient diseased, right? Um so when that person goes out into the world, they bring that chaos with them everywhere, right? Um, so for the Platonic Socrates, there really is a huge difference between being a teacher who is good and helps the student to encounter beauty and someone who just forces or foists beauty onto people. Um, and one thing that you said, and sorry, I'll, I'll wrap up here and we could move on to another question, but... Um, I, I like that you were talking about the sun because, of course, that is also a, um, a profoundly Socratic uh, analogy for understanding the good, right? That the sun warms things and by warming them activates the power of generation within them, right? So he does see um, the good as being the sun. But the reason why he doesn't bring it all together um, it's just, as I said, because you can have one without the other. Uh, and I think he would suggest that you can have um, certain things reproduced that may not be beautiful, but might still have something to them, right? Um, I think justice is one of these things, which he doesn't think is the same as beauty, right? So, so there are these distinctions. And when you have these distinctions for him, you can actually say something real. You can say, this is good for a particular reason. This food is good because this good Sorry, this good food allows your body to regenerate and rejuvenate, which for him is a form of reproduction. Right? Um, and food that doesn't do that is bad, is bad for you. Um, so it helps that it's definitive. But once you get to the side of, the, of God, who is somehow the ground for all goodness, all truth, all beauty, all justice, um, and you can say, well, how do all of those things come together in God? Even and actually in the Timaeus, um, I think that you actually do see the character of Timaeus, who's talking to Socrates, start to approach this question. And as he approaches it, essentially what he says is it's beyond us, it's completely beyond us. And once we come upon that question, that deeper question of how does it all come together, what is the source of everything that exists? That for him is the subject of prayer. And I think that it is important to distinguish what we can know through our minds, which is maybe we can know something about goodness and the reality of goodness and something about beauty and the reality of beauty. So in a way, that's a kind of another level of transcendence, right? You have transcendence, which is this is unchangeable, but we can kind of know it. And then you have this even higher level of transcendence, which comes to the, the creator of all things. And yeah, and when we approach that in the mode of prayer. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I want to um, dive a little more deeply into uh, how important beauty was to the Greeks. Um, and I was, I came across this word in, in one of the books I've been reading. It's a Greek word, forgive me if I mispronounce it, um, kalogagathea. And I know that you can speak into this, Matt. So what I'd like you to do is help us understand that word and any other word connected to it. 
and maybe paint a picture for us of the poetic beauty behind its meaning. Because I know the Greek words have a poetic beauty. You and I have talked about that multiple times, and it matters a lot. And I think it'll help us and our teachers and, and parents listening understand it a little more deeply. Yeah, yeah, sure. And maybe I'll start with the, the last thing you said about the poetic dimension of it. And I think this is often misunderstood, you know. Um, Plato is somewhat of an innovator in terms of being a prose writer. Um, some of the people we would call philosophers that preceded him actually wrote in verse. That's very puzzling to us, right? Like why, like if you're trying to parse out something logically or talk about being like, why do you have to write in verse? It's not a poem. Um, but I think that even phrasing like this kind of speaks to your question of what beauty meant for the ancients. Um, if you're, oh, I'll put it like this. If it is the case that beauty is manifest in nature, and you're going to talk about the order that is in nature and you don't speak beautifully then obviously you don't know what you're doing right it's not enough to just dryly speak about the beautiful then you make it boring um it's important that you be able to speak of it in a way that really captures it so that of course they're going to be speaking in verse um and also to your point about them being very poetic you know i think of something and someone once said to me, oh, the Greeks were so stupid, they thought that um, there were these four elements, you know, earth, water, air, and fire, you know, like, we know that the elements are these, you know, we're looking at rare earth metals, and, you know, things like this, that, or the other, and, you know, setting aside why you would call those elements or not, okay, let's set that aside for a minute, but what I said to him is, I said, yeah, the Greeks, complete idiots. I said, do you agree that there are three states of matter, solid, liquid, and gas? And he's like, sure. And something that's responsible for the change between those states of matter, which is energy, he's like, yeah. And I'm like, you're a complete idiot. And he's like, how dare you? And I'm like, well, that's what you just called the Greeks. What do you think earth, water, air, and fire meant for them? Like, do you think that they actually thought like everything in the world was made out of little campfires? Of course not. This was poetic language, right? Mm. Um, when they saw fire, it was obvious to them that there was something extraordinary there behind it that was not completely discernible by the senses. Um, and it's obvious that it's not discernible by the senses because you can rub things together and fire appears where? Seemingly out of nowhere. Mm. But they weren't foolish. They didn't think it actually appeared out of nowhere. They thought that there had to be something else there that they didn't see that was responsible for that. And of course, they were right about that in a very scientific way. Um, but when they speak about it, they speak about it poetically, the same way you say there's a fire in my soul, you know, mm -hmm. um, they understand like that everything for them is poetic. And I think that when one fails to understand that they speak as my friend, which, you know, I shouldn't be rude to people the way I just described in that anecdote. I was younger then. But, you know, the way my <laughs> friend was speaking um, of them uh, in this very dismissive way because you didn't appreciate both the poetry and the profundity and, and also the discipline of that poetry um, that was at work there. But anyway, to get to get to the heart of your question, Kalo Kagathea, so that kind of builds on what Trey was saying is that it means um, it comes from Kalos Kai Agathos, uh, which would mean the noble or beautiful and good man. And Kalos Kagathia is that turned into a kind of noun saying, you know, what is the quality of being beautiful and good? Um, and that, and sometimes we say it means gentlemanliness. That's true, but doesn't really capture the whole truth of it. Um, it does describe what it means to be a flourishing, complete, and virtuous human being, right? Um, and one of the things you find happening, for example, uh, going back again to the Platonic Socrates, is he's interpreting this. And, you know, for the ancients as for us, I mean, you know, they have all the same passions and ambitions that we do, you know. Um, they struggled with the same dilemmas in education that we do. Right. You have a teacher that will say, you know, listen to this, read this. I can help you to understand this more deeply and be more virtuous and be moderate and courageous. And, you know, and they might have had kids that are looking at this and thinking, this is boring. What I want to be is rich and powerful. 
why don't you tell me how to do that? And of course, there were teachers that would come forward and be like, look, look, my son, come here. I'll tell you all you need to know about how to be rich and powerful. And I mean, if that sounds a little too vulgar, let's put it in different terms. I'll tell you how to be a good provider for your family, how to be secure, how to be safe. And there's people in life that are going to come at you, and I'm going to teach you how to deal with those people, right? So you have these, these conflicts in education, and then how does Talos Kagathia understood in this context? Well, you look at people and you say, look, you know, they're up there standing in front of everyone. They speak. Everyone listens to them. They have great estates. They have um, great friends. They have power. People care about them. These are real. These are influencers. Isn't that beautiful? Don't they look beautiful to you? Aren't they good? And you say, well, that's Kalos Kagathia. Hmm. And in in ways sometimes blunt, sometimes subtle, Socrates will say, maybe you don't really know what that means to be Kalos Kagathia, or maybe you've been seduced, you know, um, by a false understanding of it. And you can kind of see the advantage of him trying to say, you know, there's a reason why we have these two words, Kalos and Agathos. If they just meant the same thing, if the one that appears beautiful to you up on the stage is also the good one, we could, we could just have one word for that. <laughs> um, but we have two words. And subtly starts to suggest, you know, Ultimately, when it comes down to it, and um, and forgive me, I'm going to shift gears here just for a brief mm -hmm. minute. Um, you're very patient with me speaking at such great length. Um, but, you know, you look at a, a Socratic seminar and, and, and the kids come together and they're talking to each other. And I would say that in moments like that, it kind of comes out that there's really only two major reasons for us ever to speak to each other. And we think there are many reasons, but it, I think it boils down to two. It's either to learn something from someone else, which is true, or it's to dominate the other person. Hmm. And the domination can sometimes be in gentler forms. I'm expressing myself. I need you to acknowledge what I am saying. Hmm. Um, I need you to respect me. But when I say that, am I speaking of truth? No, I'm speaking of your submission to me or to my view. And even if I say, and in turn, I will submit to you, but still, this is just mm -hmm. dominating and submitting in turn. That's not the same thing as saying, no, we're gonna work together and we're gonna talk and we're gonna learn something, something which is not my possession or your possession, but something which, again, to what you were saying, Trey, something which might illuminate us, which is outside of us, you know, um, as the sun illuminates the world so that we can learn of it. And again, you can see, what Socrates is doing here with the way he's kind of unpacking and trying to understand Kalo Kagathia is to say that if it was just about beauty and there was nothing else, maybe dominating each other would be sufficient. I have a notion in my mind of how this should look and I am going to make it happen, you know? <laughs> um, but if you're also going to be Agathos, then you have to kind of respect the other person, you have to respect that this order is not your possession. Um, and you also respect on some level to his understanding that there is a power of reproduction, which is also not your possession. In fact, reproduction is something that you cannot control in a way. Hmm. Uh, I know he tried to do it, right? But ultimately, the, but and he understands this too. It's not like the Greeks weren't aware that there's things you could do to not have children, for example. Um, they, they're very well versed on it. But mm -hmm. But nevertheless, we don't, with a word, command and things reproduce, right? Things reproduce in the way that nature gives this to us. Or if you're a Christian, you would say the way that God gives this to us. And of course, eventually Socrates in, in the Timaeus learns from Timaeus that a God is responsible for this power within nature, right? So, so this is something that we don't own we don't possess. In fact, it's something that we should approach with reverence and that actually, in a way, you have to let go, right? Um, and again, you see this as a teacher that ultimately what the student learns is an encounter between that student and the truth. And it's the truth and the nature of the student together, which allows education to actually occur. 
right? Again, we're just we're just the that we're just the the farmers who are gently arranging things to make that more likely to happen. But we can't order it. We can't make it happen. Mm -hmm. um, and the person who is Kalos and Agathos understands that. And therefore, they respect human freedom, they respect what transcends them, they respect all sorts of things. So in, in this way of approaching it, he tries to offer this new image of Kalos Kagathia that challenges and subverts the more everyday, I, I would even dare say, kind of secular, power hungry, um, which isn't, it doesn't always appear, as I said before, in, the, in it doesn't always seem like it's about domination, but beneath the surface it is. And he tries to challenge that with a truer account of what uh, Kalokagathia means. Mm -hmm. right. For, go ahead, Trey. Well, I think we can all relate um, uh, to the teacher or the parent, for that matter, who is just yeah. struggling and, and baffled uh, by um, this 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 human being in front of them, this child that is refusing to <laughs> submit. <laughs> Right um, to uh, well, let's let's just say the good thing that the, the parent and the teacher wants um, so badly for the life of that child. Mm -hmm. And what I'm what I'm learning, um, and what I think I hear in 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 your comments there, Matt, is that uh, really what we're looking for is a mutual submission to the truth. Right, and so if the student or the child can see that that adult person in their life submitting to something higher than them, right, submitting to the truth, um, and then the child is invited, um, or the student, uh, adult or child, uh, the student is in the position to come alongside the teacher in mutual submission to the truth. Um, that's something very different than this domination that you're describing, um, and I wonder. Um, you know, I've, I've, I've heard it beautifully said that a teacher is much more like a custodian, let's say, um, sort of, um, uh, I, I think John Senior said, like a janitor holding open the door saying, I think you guys should see what's in this room. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, and, and I've also pictured it as like, a, as like a waiter coming around with a dessert tray and saying, you really need to, need to try these things, right? Um, what would you say then is the relationship um, of authority um, in terms of, you know, there there is there is some obviously some authority invested in the teacher and in that student teacher relationship, um, but I would imagine you'd want to connect it back to an, a, a higher authority, right? And not just an authority that, that that solely resides within the teacher. Yeah, no, that's an excellent question. I'm really glad you asked it, by the way, because, you know, think about the teacher that's, as you just said, like in a classroom where a degree of chaos does ensue. Um, or what if they're teaching, you know, and, you know, God forbid, but it happens, you know, students get into a fight, you know, and should you say, well, <laughs> you know, I can't impose order here. You know, they They have to they have to come to it, you know. And um, one thing, by the way, which I haven't discussed, and I'll just mention by the by here, of course, is that something that for the Platonic Socrates that is connected is um, with this idea of reproduction is love. And and that I'll come back to it in a minute. Um, but, you know, let's come back to this situation of the kids are fighting. And I think that in other works by Plato, you know, like the laws, um, you know, there's the Athenian stranger, not Socrates, but he understands that there is violence in the world. In fact, they understood it far better than us. So far as we know, they fought battles every year. And you don't know that right at first because you'll read through cities and be like, well, here's the Peloponnesian War. And it's like, well, that's just because he thought those were the battles worth talking about, you know? Um, so a citizen in those days had to be ready to fight uh, pretty much at any time. And they did fight regularly and risk their lives regularly. So they're, they're, they know that there's violence. Um, and they understand that while it would be nice if we, when we can come together and talk about things and resolve things that way, when someone's coming to take your life, set fire to your home, home enslave your children, there may be a moment where the, the talking is done. Um, now, thinking in the classroom, of course, you're not going to draw a sword and deal with the kids there in that way, I, I certainly hope. But you might, if they're fighting, you might physically restrain them. 
And that that is not that is not an act of respecting their freedom. Um, and there may be other times when things are out of control and a teacher will raise their voice and speak in a commanding way and exert their authority. But I think one of the things the Platonic Socrates is trying to say is, but what I don't want you to confuse is the beautiful with the good or either of them with compulsion. Hmm. Right? Compulsion is something that that sometimes and a degree of coercion may be necessary when there is no other way, truly no other right. way. Um, or when, when the risk to the kid's life is great, yeah. um, or to their physical well-being. Um, well, I want to I want to jump in here real quick, if that's all right, Matt, yeah. and then and then Adrian um, perhaps can uh, can uh, take take our conversation to the next uh, in the next direction. Um, what you're reminding me of is something that um, I believe uh, Beatrice says, and forgive me, listeners, if I've said this before. Um, multiple times. It's always on my mind, seemingly. Uh, we were talking about Dante, and Beatrice says at one point, I think it's I think it's in the Purgatorio, she says, if the will won't will, nothing can force it. Right, right. And that, I think, is, is related to what you're saying about compulsion. And on a, on a very practical day-to-day -day level in the classroom, what that makes me realize is that um, I can... I can um, offer certain things to my students. I can give them instruction. I can, um, I can, um, you know, lay all these things out for them. But I can't, um, I can't take them up for them, right? I can't, I can't force them to learn. Um, I can just really, um, just offer it and 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 model it for them. Right. And what th That's what often right. frustrates, especially the, the the teacher who's working with, let's say, high school seniors, um, is a feeling of failure or a feeling of, um, well, I just wasn't able to get this student to to this level of understanding or uh, to develop these certain habits. And what what then oftentimes happens is. Um, I think schools will will consider themselves to sort of be like the last ditch effort in the life of this student, mm -hmm. as if as if anything outside of these doors is just sort of, you know, gnashing of teeth. You know, like like if they don't get it here, <laughs> right? There's no hope, and that is a sin against hope, really, um, because um, at that point, uh, it seems to me that we just need to uh, trust in the providence of God that we can. That we've done what we can do, and that that student will go on. And perhaps, if they haven't learned certain lessons by the time they're 16, 17 years old, it may take until they're 36 to figure them out. Right. And and for for a teacher to be willing to to sort of let the student go uh, in that way, um, versus trying to force feed them or or force uh, some sort of behavior. Um, yeah, no, exactly. And and um, two quick things, or maybe three quick things I'll say here is one is just to briefly uh, comment on what you said about authority. And I think there is a slight danger here because there's authority which comes from the capacity to threaten. And even raising your voice in an angry way is a threat. You know, even if you say, well, it's, I'm not going to hit the kids, but on a, a certain kind of subconscious level, you hear that, you hear that anger, somewhere behind it is is. A, a fear generated by the thought that physical violence might be possible, you know, right. um, and that's an authority of which we human beings are the arbiters. Like if I'm going to exert coercion, I am going to do it. Mm -hmm. But then there's a second kind of authority, which is the authority that you were just talking about um, that pertains to, I am a guide, you know, toward the beautiful or in some sense, a nursemaid, you know, here at the, at the moment of birth you know, another, sure. another platonic way of talking about it. And you do have authority there, but it's a borrowed authority, right? And uh, to your point, it's, it's a kind of authority in which you too, along with the student, actually have to be receptive, ad adopt a submissive orientation toward that which is higher to you. Um, so it's a qualified or borrowed authority. And I think that a huge mistake that can be made is confusing the coercive authority with this borrowed authority, which emerges from a, a guiding yet still submissive posture toward the truth. 
-hmm. and we shouldn't confuse the one kind of authority um, mm -hmm. with the other. Uh, and then something else to the point of what you said about the frustration. I mean, it's this is something which is really hard, right? And the uh, so much prudence is necessary here is that there might be a student that, yeah, you are really trying to help and they're not going to take it. And to your point about Beatrice, you know, they're not going to take it. And if you push it, you're not helping to the point of like you want them to see the good things. Well, from a Christian mm -hmm. standpoint, the best is God's creation, which is an overflow of his love. Um, that in a sense, you know, as the Platonic Socrates is saying, like this reproductive power, um, you know, at its, at its most intense, you know. Um, so you want them to see that, but you want them to see it not by freely encountering it, which is also how God creates through freedom, Mm -hmm. You want them to appreciate it by being forced to appreciate it. It's like, well, mm -hmm. so you're trying to bring them into the presence of the good using a means which is the opposite of the good, right? And uh, just as you can't really help right. someone to appreciate the beautiful when you speak in a way which is ugly, right? Um, so if you've done everything that you can, then you're right. I think you're quite right. I mean, I think it is both looking at Platonic philosophy and at Christian teaching um, we are called to say, this is not in my hands. And it's not in my hands because I am not the author of all things, actually. You know, um, right. I'm, right. you know, I'm standing in the place where providence has brought me and I do my best here. But, <laughs> you know, there are people above me, even human beings who are above me. And then there's divine power, which is above that. Um, but where you want to be careful is you don't want someone to come in to do, uh, a lackluster job as a teacher and say, well, yeah, the kids didn't really learn anything, but it's in the hands of God, right? It's like, well, whoa, wait a second, you know, it is in the hands of God, but, you know, you were given a task and you didn't do everything that it was reasonable for you to be expected to do, right? And I think that's where the judgment comes in, which is hard, is, and I, I think you put it in a very human way, the teacher who blames themselves. And they blame themselves because they rightly hold themselves to a high standard, mm -hmm. but you don't want them to hold themselves to such a high standard that in order to meet it, they become tyrannical, right? And it's mm -hmm. and it's yeah. a gray area, and it's just it's it's very difficult to know exactly where to pinpoint it. Um, which is why, to get to your point earlier, Adrian, um, the poetic is so important. Mm -hmm. um, Plato didn't write treatises; he wrote works about human beings talking about things. Sometimes it's abstract, but we forget that, and we're like, oh, this is very abstract. No, it's actually very embodied because it's telling you how a flesh and blood human being speaks abstractly. Um, but I think that one thing which is sometimes not appreciated, uh, for example, in a work like The Republic, they'll say, oh, Socrates is very much against poetry. He's very much against Homer. And, um, and you can say, yeah, 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 he really criticizes Homer. By the way, how often does Socrates cite Homer as an authority? To your point, uh, Trey, how often does he cite Homer as an authority who taught him something really important about the truth or virtue or beauty? If you look carefully, you'll see it's all the time. Um, in fact, on the very points that he says poetry is deficient, in other parts of the text, he says he learned about this from Homer. So I think to a subtle reading of the Republic, you realize the problem isn't with Homer. The problem is with not understanding how to read Homer. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and when you understand how to read Homer, Homer is a great authority in the, in the qualified sense. And exactly in the sense that Homer is at the beginning of the Iliad, sing goddess. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'm the medium. I'm not the author. I'm the medium. You know, so it's, it's actually all there in Homer if you can appreciate it. Um, so the importance of the poetic is that I can talk about virtue till my face is blue. Mm -hmm. But when you read in Homer that Priam, right at the, I, I hope it, for those who haven't read the Iliad, I'm not ruining it by giving away the ending. But, you know, when Priam at the end of that work meets Achilles, who is the great enemy of his city and who has killed 
many, many of his children, including his favorite son, Hector. And he's trying to get Hector's body back from Achilles. And Achilles has desecrated this body of this son that Priam loves. And he comes in as a supplicant and he kisses Achilles' hands. And he says, as I kiss these hands, and he knows that Achilles feels great hatred for him and hatred for his city. And he says, but I want you to look at me and take pity on me and think about your own father. Hmm. And he says, for I have borne that which no person should ever have to bear. I have kissed the hands that have slaughtered my children. Hmm. And you have to think about that. You know, we actually have evidence now, maybe that Achilles was a real person. We have evidence that Troy was a real place. You could say, well, this is just in the mind of the poet. Maybe it wasn't. Maybe this really happened. And when you think about this, someone who's kissed the hands of someone who has killed their children in hatred, what does it take to do that? What does it take for this other person who hates this city to set that aside? And I would say there's nothing in Plato which is profound or startling or painful or extraordinary is this moment. And that's where you see real beauty and goodness because both of them are freely coming together. Both of them are freely resolving their differences, but they're also looking at the greatest chaos, which is the violence when human beings are killing each other. Yeah. And they're setting that aside to be together in peace. Right. Right. Well, the wow. poetry is not just about what really happened, but about what really happens. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, and, and without I, it, philosophy is as nothing to say. Mm -hmm. Well, I know that Matt has other, he's very busy and has other meetings to attend to. And I really wish we could keep going because this is great. We're going to have you back again. I'm sure you'll, you'll come back, Matt. I mean, you've ended us on well, such a, a, such a sacred note. Actually, I feel like I feel like you took us into a, a very sacred moment. It's really hard to interrupt, interrupt that. Um, we always like to close our podcast asking, uh, what's a quote from a book that's been a huge impact on you or an, an author that you think is um, underread or perhaps that you wish you had read earlier in your life? Do you have a moment to share that? Yeah, sure. And I'll say one quick thing. And as you know, we are a little short on time, but I still have a couple of minutes and um but I, I'm going to punt slightly by saying the quotation I just gave. Okay. You know, I have kissed the hands that slew my children um, mm -hmm. is something that I think is so interesting because in Christianity, forgiveness, love and forgiveness are so extraordinarily important. And the pagans, Homer doesn't have the light of Christianity and doesn't know about the incarnation. And yet you can still see mm -hmm. that I think that he approaches with great reverence the moment of forgiveness. Um, and it is extremely rare among the ancients, extremely rare, as opposed to in scripture where it's like every second moment, God is like, I, I have to forgive you again. <laughs> um, but even there, they knew the power of it because people will say, why does the Iliad not end with the end of the war? Because it's not about the war. It's about forgiveness. That's what that poem is about. But uh, to answer your other question about a um, someone who is neglected, as I would say, um, the Roman comedian Plautus. And uh, and if someone's like, well, that's out of the blue. Of course, because that's what you mean when you say who is neglected. Um, there's a play that um, Plautus wrote called The Captives. And it's a play about slavery and about the ancient practice of slavery and war. Um, where, you know, you go into combat and someone surrenders and you enslave them and maybe you you conquer the city and you enslave their children. And it's about, do the slaves actually deserve to be enslaved? Hmm. And what are the kinds of passions that emerge in someone who is a master? And it's actually very complicated because one of the characters is taking slaves because their child has been enslaved and they want to ransom the slaves. But it also raises other questions about at one point it actually suggests that someone who lives as a slave and endures slavery might actually exercise the virtues greater than others. Um, it does talk about the nature of love and, and it does actually approach a moment in which there should be forgiveness perhaps, but there isn't. 
And something that I find very powerful about that play is, is just how deep it goes into the way that human beings can exploit and harm each other, but in a comedy, not in a tragedy. Um, I think that we often think that the ancients had a somewhat artless or crude understanding of slavery, and you realize here that actually they do understand its injustice. They do understand the virtues, or at least Plautus does, and he's trying to educate his audience about this. But when you get to the end of it, and the moment of forgiveness that at least I was hoping for doesn't occur, you realize that, and I think Plautus is right to not give you that moment of forgiveness because his point is, but there is darkness in us. Hmm. Even when we come better, even when we see the greatness, there is darkness in us. And I think it's a nice compliment to Homer because Homer is where the, the enslaving people isn't even questioned, really. But forgiveness is there. Right. And um, Plautus, I think, in many ways helps you to complete the picture. But you realize that where Christianity brings it all together in a moment, um, so many parts of this are only in these little fragments among the ancients. But Plautus, although a comedian and in many ways the play is silly, but it's also very profound. And I think it's something that in this day and age, with some of the issues we're struggling with in education, I think Plautus is someone who is often neglected, but definitely worth looking at. And by the way, just as another pitch for him, huge influence on Shakespeare's comedies too, so. Nice. Thank you, Matt. This was this was a treat, as always. <laughs> yeah, 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 uh, uh, for me as well. And and thank you for your, your excellent questions, uh, both of you, by the way, just extraordinary questions, obviously born from your, your long and deep experience as teachers uh, and parents. And, um, you know, I did my best, but, uh, you, know, <laughs> you know, these these are the kinds of questions, as you said, one could explore for a lifetime. And, yeah. and I know that I'm certainly not up to the task of answering them adequately or fully, but they're, they're always worth exploring. So thank you. It was a pleasure chatting with you both. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening. We invite you to experience the art of teaching through interactive learning communities at our Patreon page. Visit patreon.com forward slash classical education. Also, be sure to join the conversation on our Facebook community at facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash classical education. We are a listener supported podcast, so your support makes this podcast possible. As the great artist and educator John Ruskin once wrote, well, my friends, the final result of the education I want you to give your children will be, in a few words, this. They will know what it is to see the sky. They will know what it is to breathe it. And they will know, best of all, what it is to behave under it, as in the presence of a Father who is in heaven. <laughs>